Baruch Haba, welcome to our DW interview, uh, Ron Prosser, Ambassador of the State of Israel in Germany. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, your father, Ulrich Proskauer, was born here in Berlin, where we are sitting right now in the city. He and his family fled Nazi Germany in 1933. What does it feel like for you to be the ambassador of the State of Israel in today's Germany? So, uh, yes, this is uh, closing a circle. So I was thinking, you know, here is uh, Bertolt Proskauer, my grandfather, a Prussian decorated officer that felt German, was German, and basically had to flee Germany. And uh, when I return as the grandchild of Bertolt Proskauer, uh, as Israel's ambassador, the ambassador of the nation state of the Jewish people, after 74 years, it's not just emotional, but it shows you know, that the Jewish people have made, you know, an amazing deed by establishing the State of Israel and uh, that I can represent very, very proudly uh, independent Israel uh, that is on the cutting edge of technology in all different parts of, uh, of uh, the world. The German government just announced a national strategy for combating anti-Semitism. It's the first of its kind and many people say, why only now? Why hasn't this happened earlier? Um, what do you expect from the German government to do against anti-Semitism? First of all, I have to commend the German government doing that. There's always, when you do something, people say, why didn't you do it before? But I think it shows really the determination of the German government and all parts of German society to fight anti-Semitism uh, because uh, fighting anti-Semitism in the sense shows something about how the German society looks and accepts uh, people from different faiths. I think there's a, a trend uh, not just in Germany, but in Europe, of rising anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism incidents, and by dealing with it, talking about it, and basically fighting it, we are creating a better society and a better world. German politicians have actually said they would fight against anti-Semitism since a long time. And still we have seen in the Documenta, for example, uh, that there have been cases of anti-Semitism. Does the German government do enough? So Documenta, I think, is a, is a good example of uh, how anti-Semitism moves from the margins to uh, the center and is being accepted as part of the debate. And uh, this has to be fought very strongly because uh, in the sense, all the explanations and all the stories that uh, very clear anti-Semitic pictures have to be debated, is it or isn't it not anti-Semitic, is something that uh, I think should have been uh, really uh, fought much stronger. And, uh, and I think that uh, here there's a lot of uh, things that should be done, uh, not just on right-wing extremism, but also on left-wing anti-Semitism. And this is something that we should all work together. And I think uh, the issue here is that the government uh, plan on fighting anti-Semitism is wide. It goes to the whole of the structure of German, uh, uh, the German uh, states. And I think this is a beginning which uh, shows that uh, this is a high priority for the German, German government, which I think is very commendable. You have been very present in these debates about anti-Semitism in Germany, about debates, uh, for example, uh, about the Documenta. 
um, not only in articles that you published in German newspapers, but also on Twitter. Sometimes one could even see you uh, verbally fighting with some other Israelis in Germany. Um, is this still diplomacy to, to, um, well, to fight in the public, even if it's verbal fights? <laughs> well, first of all, we have to think, uh, what is innovative diplomacy? I think diplomacy has changed uh, through the years. And because of communication, because of the fact that in the past, you know, everyone waited uh, for telegrams that came from an ambassador. Today, uh, I think that because of communication and because of the fact that we live in a different and a, I think, much more reactive world, we have to adapt. And those people who don't adapt, like in technology and like in business, uh, are not really going to be effective. And I think that uh, innovative diplomacy means that uh, we should also, as part of bilateral relations between countries, uh, do things on the cultural uh, side, more on the scientific side, and more on the youth side. I would like to go back to something that you said before about anti-Semitism in Germany. Um, combating anti-Semitism from the left, you mentioned, but what about anti-Semitism from the right? Just this week we have seen that some um, suspected members of a group probably affiliated to the so-called Reichsbürger movement um, have been arrested. Um, are you uh, concerned about right-wing extremism in of Germany? Of course, of course. I mean, this is... Uh, this is not just clear, but uh, when we talk about fighting anti-Semitism, this is of all colors and all shades, in a sense. So, of course, this is uh, something that uh, in every society has to be fought. And right-wing extremism, I don't have to repeat things, you know. But just think of the abnormality of the fact that Jews, not just in Germany, in Europe, everywhere, Synagogues in the year 2022 have to be protected and guarded. Schools, Jewish schools. And it's this element that we look as normal is really completely abnormal. And we have to change it and work together in order to really, and that's through education, through understanding the other. Uh, because at the end of the day, this is the only answer to fight uh, right-wing uh, extremism, left-wing anti-Semitism, uh, education, education, education. If we look at education, also one could see, you know, the history that we mentioned in the beginning of this interview of your father having to flee, you now being here present as the ambassador of the State of Israel in Germany, in Berlin. Um, how would you describe the German-Israeli relationships, which sometimes also seem like a little wonder looking at history? First of all, we have to uh, give a lot of credit to uh, two leaders. Ben-Gurion on the Israeli side that, uh, just think, three years after the establishment of the State of Israel with survivors and people, you know, in Israel and just, you know, the beginning of uh, the State of Israel was willing uh, to talk to Germany and to Konrad Adenauer also, leaders that show that if you really look into the future, and work against opposition from inside, you can really build a bridge which was very hard to build. But I think that when I look at it now, the German-Israeli relationship is so strong on different levels, on the scientific level, on the cultural level, on the, uh, I would even call the strategic level between both countries and especially something that I really would like to push forward, and that is the youth exchange. We just signed a Jugendwerk that basically between Israel and Germany, and I hope that through that we will be able to remember the past, but also build a better future. So if I look at it, I think that after the United States of America, Germany is Israel's most important and strategic ally. And uh, 
and it's due to a lot of work by many good people at all parts of society, which I think at the end of the day is the key to an amazing relationship, not just between the leadership, but between the people. You described the strong relationships. Uh, some people even speak of a strong friendship between uh, Germany and Israel. And that from friends, from friend to friend, from one to another, uh, one should be allowed to also mention criticism, critique, um, on the state of Israel, on the political level. Um, and Germany has always made it very clear that um, their foreign policy in the Middle East um, has been based on the principles of a two-state solution. Um, now Israel's Prime Minister-elect Benjamin Netanyahu is about to form a government including leaders of the far right uh, like Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich who have made it very clear that they think there should not be a Palestinian state. Um, should the government stop? talking about a two-state solution, hoping for a two-state solution? So first, uh, I'd like to you know, recall into memory that Prime Minister Netanyahu in his Bar Ilan speech talked about uh, a two-state solution. I don't think he's uh, changed uh, his view on this. Uh, and I think that uh, a two-state solution is a solution, but when we hear people talk about two-state solution, we usually hear them say a two-state solution. It has to be Jewish and democratic. And on the Palestinian side, we don't hear anything. And I think it's crucial to basically say that on the, we, we are also looking for a democratic Palestinian state. Because the issue here is, what state do you want to establish? We cannot and would not establish a terror state, you know, as a uh, neighbor to Israel. Uh, we tried to do something in Gaza when we completely went out of Gaza and created, a, it created a terror state. Hamas has taken over and basically created a situation where not only didn't it lead to peace, but it led to an establishment of a terror state. So when people talk about a two-state solution, they should also make a point what they expect from a Palestinian state as a democratic, as a state that basically will allow to have elections from time to time. You know, uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, to do elections every four or five years and not wait for nearly 25 years to do so. But would it still be possible to even form a Palestinian state with all of the settlements that do exist already um, in the West Bank and that um, are already also been talks about um, more outposts that have been so far illegal, even by Israeli law, um, will be legalized under the new government. Um, will it be possible to even think about a Palestinian state if there are so many Israeli settlements in the West Bank? First, I'd like to remind people that uh, the Israeli people, when there was a partner on the other side, we always reached out. We always reached out in peace. So uh, factually, uh, when Sadat came over to Jerusalem, three years, no, less than three years, we had peace with Egypt. We have peace with Jordan. Israel made territorial concessions for this peace. So the question is not the issue of the willingness uh, on the Israeli side, because we were always willing. We were talking about it. We don't have the time here to go to the different proposals that went there. So I think that the most important thing here is to, first of all, factually understand that the people of Israel have always wanted peace, but also to understand that Israel has the right for security to defend itself and not to create a terrorist state uh, just uh, uh, over the uh, uh, over the border, and, uh, and I'd like to really focus on that, because I think that uh, 
you know, it's very nice to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the importance of Israel's security from the outside. But the real issue here is to protect and defend the only democratic state in the region. And as you know, and as your viewers know, we don't see Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, or San Marino in our region, meaning that uh, we have not just to conduct a dialogue, but to understand that this dialogue is, is basically something that uh, should reach a democratic Palestinian side on the other side. Mm -hmm. If not, it won't work. We will not, will not create a terror state as a neighbor. But speaking of dialogue, um, because you represent the Israeli side, so I will ask about the Israeli side. Obviously, if uh, a Palestinian representative would sit here in front of me, I would, of course, ask different questions. Um, but um, you, as the ambassador of the State of Israel, um, do you see a dialogue um, possible with this new government, with um, people that have been described not only by foreigners but also by Israelis themselves as um, not only far right but even as extremists. So I would uh, I would suggest to everyone to basically test and examine Israel, Israel's government, in what we do, and uh, and not you know what people say that uh, you know, basically that they're going to do or what people said in the past. As you know, not just in Israel, there's a difference between what you say before or during the election and what happens afterwards. I can just say that uh, Israel is led by a very experience, uh, will be led by Bibi Netanyahu, uh, who has a lot of experience. It's his third time as a prime minister, and uh, I think he can navigate Israel to, uh, to I think, a, a, a very prosperous uh, future, also enhancing the relationship that we have with the Emirates, the Abraham Accords, and I want to, you know, again, remind people that in the Negev, uh, a couple of months ago, the Israeli foreign minister was the host to uh, the Egyptian foreign minister, the Moroccan foreign minister, Bahraini and Emirati. If we would have thought, imagined this, years ago, people would say they are hallucinating. So it's possible. We have to work hard on it, and we have to really listen to both sides. And I think if we do that, we will have a better future. Speaking of the Abram Accords um, and the diplomatic relations that Israel started with Morocco, for example, now during the World Cup in Qatar, one could see that uh, Israeli journalists, for example, were cut off um, from interviewing other people, um, soccer fans um, during the World Cup. Um, they wouldn't answer. Um, some Israelis were even insulted. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, is that not a sign that these Abram Accords are cold? diplomatic relationships that have not come to the people yet? First of all, I think that the people-to-people -people element is crucial between uh, countries and societies. It's not just between governments. And especially in the Arab world, what we see is with the Abraham Accords is really an element of people-to-people. -people. They come over to Israel, Israelis come over there, and I think perceptions and different stigmas that people had in the past are falling down. Uh, this is the only way forward. We need more with that, with uh, Egypt. We need more with Jordan. But what we have is we have to strengthen, because you're absolutely right. This is the beginning, and we have to do more in that direction, uh, because uh, uh, this, is, this is really the only way forward, and I want to tell why I think it's such of you know, mutual interest. I think uh, the leaders in the Abraham Accords, uh, from uh, Muhammad bin Zayed to Muhammad VI, 
to the king of Bahrain. The issue here is that they thought that for their own population, it's really beneficiary to have relations with Israel because it can help them on the economic, on the technology side. And by deciding to do that, they also feel that they can influence Israel's policies much more than my sitting on the balcony and shouting it's a lousy show. I think this combination, if we strengthen and really deepen this relationship, it will stabilize the region and will allow us to move forward to really a more peaceful environment. But speaking of a peaceful environment, um, if we look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right now there are basically no relationships whatsoever. We haven't seen any peace talks in years. Uh, on the contrary, we have seen, especially this year and in the past months, uh, a rise in violence um, on both sides. Um, every day there are Palestinians being killed, combatants and also civilians by the Israel Defense Forces. Um, and also we have seen terror attacks uh, in cities like Tel Aviv, Hadera, Jerusalem uh, lately. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you, do you fear even a third intifada? So first of all, I think that uh, you will see, and as you see now, Israel dealing with terror nearly every day. Uh, dealing with terror every day, and this uh, I can I can tell you and the viewers will continue. We will really not allow uh, terror to be in the streets of uh, Israel, and those who conduct terror are going to really uh, uh, very clearly be uh, be punished in that. The other element is that uh, when we talk about the region. Uh, we talk about a region where, you know, in the past a lot of people only talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as the major conflict in the Middle East. No, it's not. It's not that it's not important to solve it. But Syria, Libya, Iraq, Lebanon, should I continue, Yemen, it's not a major conflict in the Middle East. So. What's the reason that there's so many conflicts that basically don't concern Israel directly? The issue here is, again, to really understand that the state of Israel, the only democratic country in this region, is on the front line fighting phenomena that Western democracies have yet to understand. Is it easy? No. But we are navigating since the establishment of the State of Israel to find the answers, to defend our citizens on the one hand and not going overboard on the other. A good example for you would be we began checking people at airports 35 years ago. And what did people say? Oi, 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 oi. You know, this is a private sphere. This is human rights. After 9-11, it's clear. And why is it clear for democracies around the world? because that's exactly, you have to defend your citizens, but not go overboard in your reaction. We feel that we are basically on the front line on those phenomena. I think you are beginning to understand a bit, and it's a different area of what's happening now with Putin in Ukraine, and why you need to defend yourself, and that uh, the importance of deterrence and defense to defend the values that we both cherish. Speaking of the war in Ukraine, um, Israel has been very careful not to get, let's say, involved too much into this conflict. Um, Israel has not sent um, any military aid other than um, most European nations, for example. Um, why is that so? First of all, uh, Israel is doing in different areas humanitarian areas, you know, different uh, things on, you know, advising, especially when we see, you know, Iranian drones that we have to deal with, by the way, in our region nearly every day, uh, reach Russia. This is for all those who thought that Iran 
was just in our region. Suddenly, they're smack in the middle of Europe. Uh, Israel, in the sense, uh, has a Russia in Syria. We have to uh, to very to navigate very sensibly, and uh, we are doing a lot again on the humanitarian side, and uh, I think we are, especially Israelis will feel with the Ukrainians because we know they're fighting for their homes. And uh, we, are, we are with them. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Toda Rabah. Thank you, and I'd like to end by wishing everyone Happy Hanukkah. This is the Festival of Lights, and we hope that with the lights we will be able to get the darkness away from different parts of the world and uh, uh, I wish everyone a happy uh, Hanukkah. Thank you very much. Thank you.